worship him and honor him. I thank him to be in his, this house today. I give honor to God and to Pastor Sweeney and First Lady Sweeney in their absence. Pray that God would be with them and strengthen them on their journey while they're traveling and cover them in Jesus' name. I give God honor for all of you being in this house today and making and pressing your way through this rain and through this storm to be here. They said it was a tropical storm today, but the saints of God are in position. And I give God praise that just like the hospital doors are open today, the church doors are open today. And just like all food places are open today, the church doors are open today. And just like every other gas station and local place doesn't shut down for the rain, I thank God that the house of God stays open during the rain. I give God praise for that and honor, and I thank God that we still have a place to worship and praise God. I thank God for my husband. I've been married to him as of Tuesday for 14 years. Minister Webb, can you raise your hand, Minister Webb? <laughs> I thank God for all, for all these wonderful 14 years it's been. It's been a wonderful, great 14 years, and I thank God for him. Look at him. <laughs> he looks so wonderful. And I thank God for him. We're matching today, if you notice, to celebrate this anniversary. <laughs> Christian Sales, he can't talk about you and Jasmine and your leopard anymore. Amen, because we're, we're matching this Sunday. <laughs> Amen. So God is good, and I thank God for all of you being here. We're going to dive into his word right now. Great God. We are going to continue with today's topic. Thank you, worship team. I appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to continue with today's topic. Pastor Sweeney uh, is doing a series on the alien agenda. And pastor looked at me and he said, I won't be here Sunday, so I'd like you to continue my series. And I said, oh, okay, no problem. Okay, so what do you want me to preach on? Because I don't understand how to tackle this. He said, here's the topic. He said, um, he said look at ancient aliens. And he said, and God is going to lead you. And that's all he said. And I looked at pastor and I said, okay, <laughs> amen. <laughs> and so I sat there and I tried to go around what the shepherd told me. And how do many of you know that if you don't do things as the shepherd leads you, you go astray, right? Yes, boy. God gives us a shepherd for a reason, right? So I sat there and I looked at the, at the topic and I said, okay, Lord. Oh, I do need to pray for something. Sister Sweeney had sent me a text message this morning and she asked us to remember this person in prayer. So his name is Mr. Heckler. If you all can pray with me as we pray for Mr. Heckler. Um, it's one of her co-workers' dad, and she messaged Sister Sweeney uh, this morning that she lost him today, that he, um, that he had passed away. So let's remember the family. Heavenly Father, we just pray for this family and the loss, Lord God. Father, we know, Lord Jesus, what it's like to lose someone because many of us have lost people, God. Father, we pray, Father, for peace that only you can give. God, she messaged Sister Sweeney for a reason, God. She knows, Lord God, that she knows you. And Father, because of that, her faith is positioned, Father, for you to do something great. I pray, Father, that the enemy wouldn't distract her and nothing would hinder her from receiving all that you have for her today, God. And this family, uh, the Heckler family, Lord God, cover them, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I tried to go around it as I was sharing with you all and couldn't quite get it. So I sat in front of the computer at least several hours and several hours and several hours and several hours. And nothing would seem to come to me until I listened to what the shepherd said, which was, go to the ancient aliens. So I went to the ancient aliens website and there's a whole bunch of things I found. And then as soon as I looked at that site, then all of a sudden, God's word began to come to me. And he began to speak to me and began to share to, with me so many things that I have eight pages of notes. Can you believe that? I'm not going to read eight pages of notes, though. <laughs> I'm going to go through this um, simultaneously as God directs me. So as we're walking through this, first getting this topic like I shared with you, I had to go and I began to ask God for direction. And God led me down a path of biblical truths that stood out to me along this journey. So that's as Christians, we know that we are considered alien, but not as the world deems an alien. In 1 Peter 2, we are stated as being a peculiar people, and we are going to um, dive into what it means to be a peculiar people. The word peculiar in the Webster's Dictionary and in most dictionaries will make uh, the word peculiar synonymous with unusual. So look at the person next to you. 
That's an unusual person. Look at the person next to you. That is an unusual person. Do they look unusual to you? Hopefully they do. They should be unusual to you. They are an unusual person. And not because of how they physically look. We're not attributing this to how we look by our face. We're attributing this to the spirit that is inside of us. So the people in front of you, the people at the side of you, the people who are around you, the people who are near you, they are all unusual people. And it's not because of what you physically see. Look at that person again one more time. And this is more very uncomfortable at times. Find somebody to look at, please. Find someone to look at and look at them in their eyes. That eye contact you just made with that person, there is inside of that person a spirit that you don't see. And that spirit that you don't see is the unusual spirit we're talking about today. Find a teenager to look at. <laughs> That spirit that you're looking at, though it may drive you a little crazy, <laughs> that spirit is an unusual spirit, okay? It is, it is. And that unusual spirit is what we are going to tackle today. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, but you, teenagers, adults, we are a chosen, Sean, in the back, I see you, Sean, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and peculiar means unusual people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. See, the world in its quest for making sense of supernatural phenomenon have tagged new discoveries as alien. So every new discovery the world makes, they say it is what? Every new discovery that the world makes, they say it's what? Alien, because it's foreign to the normal eyes and the normal, the normal mind. And this team is also tagged as unusual. So I want you to notice that God calls us a peculiar, unusual people, and the world is tagging everything that's in this world as unusual and alien. So that word unusual pops up in scripture and is popping up in the world. And though some events may be unusual, our question today is, are we going to attribute all of this unusuality things to an omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, everywhere God? Or will we choose to strip God out of the picture and cast our lot and opinion on something that couldn't possibly be not God? That's where we are. Scientists and research and astronomers have been on a quest, and they have been trying to discover the origin of creation. See, many theories have been posed, and the most recent information that has been planted in the world is that of aliens being responsible for our existence and creation. So when you look at your teenager, look at another teenager again, according to scientists, that teenager you're looking at is, an, is created by an alien. You're like, oh, that's why they act like that. Oh, <laughs> the goal of the alien, uh, which is synonymous with unusual, or world's agenda is to discredit the voice of God on earth. So if we can get people believing that aliens have created something, that everything that's on this earth would have been created by an alien. Every situation that happens would have been created by an alien. See, the goal of the alien or the world's agenda, like I shared with us, is to discredit the voice of God. And while the goal of the alien is to, and, and while the goal of us as peculiar people is to declare the voice of God. So while the world is trying to discredit the voice of God, we as peculiar people are trying to increase the voice of God. From the voice of the world, I want to share with us just some couple of things back and forth. Here's what the world is saying, and this is, from, this is what I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share the voice of the world, and I'm going to share the voice of the church. From the voice of the world, some researchers believe data revealing the truth about our origins and connection to alien life can in fact be found by researching within. They are supporting the idea that human beings were created as biological mirror images of our pro progenitors, a superior extraterrestrial civilization. 
that paved the way for our existence millions of years ago. According to this scenario, they are saying, scientists are currently saying that the voice of God might actually have been the voice of a scientific genius from another planet. So a scientific genius possibly spoke everything into existence. And a scientific genius possibly created you. But we know from the voice of the word, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 to 3, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said. So when God says... That's what we declare as the, as the church. See, from the voice of the world, here's what else they, they say. The SETI project has been searching. What word did I say? Searching. They're searching for radio signals beamed out into space. And this is currently. This is what's going on right now in 2019. They're sending out radio signals beamed out into space by aliens from other planets. They're, they're looking for messages that aliens from other planets are sending but listen to this, the quest has proved fruitless and it has left them feeling empty and having a lack of faith in what their discoveries are finding. Now this is what they wrote, the scientists wrote, our work so far is proving fruitless. From the voice of the word, Jeremiah 29, 13, and you shall seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you should ask of my father in the name, he may give it to you. So while their, their search is creating something that's fruitless and they're continuing to search, our search has found us God and is creating fruitful behavior in our lives. That means that we have a strong foundation and a fruitful foundation. We're going to look at that fruit in a minute. From the voice of the world, the voice of the world looks for another life. From perhaps, this is the word they keep looking, using, from perhaps to take place. If one day we develop a warp drive or if other intelligent life forms discover it, perhaps a visitation will take place that settles the question once and for all. They're looking for a visitation on this earth from aliens. And perhaps aliens already have been doing so all along. And they say perhaps these aliens are walking around with us right now. And perhaps these aliens, notice they keep saying perhaps. And perhaps um, these aliens have coded information inside of our DNA that explains some of the things that go on in us. From the voice of the word, the, the Bible says in Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the words of this prophecy. Right? From the voice of the world, it says if extraterrestrials have left behind some hidden but decipherable proof of their existence to test our intelligence and level of scientific advancement, they might have left it inside the cells of our body and the DNA and the ultimate building block of life on earth. This is what they're saying. And from the voice of the word, it says that, mind you, they're saying aliens have left codes inside of us. That's why we keep advancing. And according to the word, Psalm 139, 14, it says what? That I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and marvelous are my works, and thy soul knoweth it right well. And as scripture says, your soul knows well. So though... Let's pause just for a second. So though they may keep saying that aliens, Joel, are out there, and though they may keep saying, Heidi, that information is out there, and though they may be saying, Emily, that there's aliens and extraterrestrials that are out there and putting codes inside of our body, our scripture says and, that we are fearfully, wonderfully made and our soul knows it. So you may say to yourself, well, maybe scientists don't under, no, scripture says God doesn't half step word. And when he speaks, he is very intentional about the things he puts in scripture. So he doesn't say, oh, maybe some people in their souls know. He says the soul knows very well. Even there's a scripture in Romans that says, uh, for the creation of the things from the world are clearly seen, being understood by things which were made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. 
So our soul already knows, and that's why scientists are searching, because their soul already knows that there's something that created them. That's why they're searching. But what is going on is they're trying to say that it can't be God. So if my soul already knows that something's out there, why don't I want to attribute that to God? Let's keep going. From the voice of the world, some are convinced that we've been genetically engineered by beings from other star systems. And these founders may have done so directly while visiting here hundreds of millions of years ago. But from the voice of the word, it says that both signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to the will of God will show forth in people. And these signs, and Mark 16, 17 says, and these signs will follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils and they shall speak with new tongues. They are saying also the language of the alien is what is bringing about some of the new things that are happening on earth. Are you with me? But I want us to remember, as aliens, peculiar people, we have a certain power. And that power comes from the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit has a language. And that Holy Spirit, when he speaks into the lives of his, his peculiar, unusual people, they speak forth in other what? Tongues. And when they speak forth in other tongues and other languages, things happen and things change and, and birth takes place. So though they may be saying that the aliens are speaking codes and speaking languages, we as aliens, peculiar people under God, we speak languages, but our code and what we speak from the Holy Spirit manifests. Why is that? We're going in direction here. See, it's easy for some in mainstream society to look for signs from extraterrestrial aliens and believe that these aliens speak another language and send messages from millions of years ago, but not easy to believe that a very real and present God sends messages to this peculiar people who have been given grace and mercy to speak truth with signs following them that bring a transforming change and right now answers in a 2009 society. So while it looks like we're fruitless, it looks like we're fruitless, it looks like there is no fruit, it looks like the world is going worse, it looks like things are being stagnant, it looks like things are not being said, it's because the, the scientists and the world is trying to lean on something that doesn't exist, which will never bring forth fruit, and will always leave us empty and void and looking for something else looking for answers and looking to answer questions outside of a God who exists will always produce more answers and always produce more questions for something that doesn't for something that they think doesn't exist but for something that exists some some scientists even talked about this and God opened up this for me tune into this part right now how many of you guys know that on other planets they're saying that it's hard for creatures to live other creatures to live, right? Okay. Pastor even had preached, he talked about, he said the earth is positioned in the right place. Scientists say this, that if we're bumped a little too close to the sun, we'll burn up. If we're bumped too far away from the sun, we'll freeze to death. And that earth is the exact position away from the star of the sun for us to have habitable life, right? So Mars, we know, is which planet? What'd you say, Alex? It's the eighth planet, you said? Yeah, backwards, yes, if we're coming back this way towards the sun. But if we look at, uh, you guys never remember my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, right, Christian? You're a scientist, yeah? Okay, right? So Mars is the fourth planet. If Mars is the fourth planet from our sun, so stay with me for a second. And Earth is the most biologically set location and position for human life to be. How is it possible then that some scientists say they've seen a mouse on Mars? And this topic has been debated among psychologists and scientists. And the picture, I was going to put the picture up there, um, but you can go on Ancient Aliens and see this picture. They have an actual uh, picture. And the, the picture, I don't know, they enhanced it. It looks a little like a mouse. But the psychologist, Tori, this is what the psychologists are saying. Now listen carefully. 
They are saying that the brain sometimes plays tricks on people and that these scientists, though they may think they see a mouse Shanika on top of Mars, it's possible that their brain was playing tricks on them and that it's not really a mouse, it's just what scientists want to see. And then the scientists are going back and saying, no, 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 this does look like a mouse. So now there's a debate back and forth between the psychologists and the scientists. But here's something that, that God had told me. He said, and he is so smart. He said, that's why I told the church not to look for me with their eyes. He said, because I told them to look for me by their faith. And he said, because if you look by your faith, your, your brain can't play tricks on you. Because faith sees the thing ahead of time and manifests it in the physical. And then the things that your brain would try to do, it can't do because your mind has already seen it by faith. So while the scientists may search for something that they physically see and their, their brain plays tricks on them, our brain searches for things it cannot see by faith, and we manifest those things in the spirit by faith. And that's why the God that we serve is the God that we serve, because the belief that we have and the faith that we know to bring things into existence doesn't happen because we're looking at it. And God is telling, God was telling me, he gave me a dream again last night. He showed me uh, the picture of some, uh, a woman, and she was walking with her, her child was uh, gone. And this could be for someone here, I'm not sure, but he was, he was walking with, this woman was there, she was walking around and she was holding a, a shirt. And she was saying, my child is gone. In the dream, she's saying, my child is gone. My child is gone. And they took him, they're trying to kill him. My child is gone. He's connected to something that he shouldn't be connected to. And I grabbed the hold of this woman and I wrapped my arms around her and I began to speak in tongues in this dream this morning. I began to speak in tongues in this dream and they found uh, eventually so I walked away and I said God by faith manifest this in the physical realm because I can't see where this child is and then God manifested that child and he showed up and the woman just began to cry and she said he's all broken up he's all bleeding and we began to just pray for the child and pray that God would set this child free and God would bring this child to where he needs to be and God began to restore this child do you know that the, it's not just scientists that are coming up with these things? Do you know that when I had gone to a, um, I went to a seminar, and this seminar was for, uh, for different educators throughout the uh, Anne Arundel County. Sister Carolyn took me over there to this seminar. And when I went to the seminar and I'm sitting there listening to the people, they said, oh, do you guys realize that the emergency room is now the new church door? And I looked at them and I had to, you know, I, you know when you don't pay attention at first and then you take, start paying attention and you tune in? They said, they said the, the emergency room is a new church door and this is why. It said the emergency room is a health care for rising families who need to drop off their developmentally ill patients to live at hospitals along with disabled youth who they can't take care any of anymore. And seniors and families and communities cannot reach the rising costs and help with their different family members, so they drop them off at the hospital to live. And they said the hospital now is filled with a whole bunch of people who no one can take care of. It is not all people who are physically sick. And I said, my God, what are we doing? James chapter 1 verse 27 says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. If God is calling us as a church to be there for the community, then why is the emergency room thinking that they can replace the church? And society is thinking this. This is not something that is possibly happening. This is what people are thinking now. And if people are believing in aliens, they're searching for outside of God's will for their life. And they're searching outside of the Christian person. I would, I, I feel, I took it personally. I don't want somebody, and, and this is, now I'm going to talk per, from a personal level. I don't want somebody who is going to work with me and 
being in my family and someone who I'm close to, to feel that they could never come to me to help lead them to the answers and to the truth that exists. I don't want my family members searching for aliens. I don't want my family members searching for an emergency room to drop things off. I want them to know that the power of God exists not only in my life and in something that they can have too, and that they can move forward in strength and in power, and they can begin to manifest and bring by faith the things that they searching for. Listen to me, church. God is wanting to uh, break us from a cycle that the world is connected to. And that cycle that the world is connected to is they feel that everything that they see is what they have to go after. Everything that they see, they have to believe. Everything that they see, they have to attain. Everything they see, they have to grab a hold of. God is talking to us right now and he's saying that I don't want you no longer to live according to grabbing things that you see. I want you, when you hear reports, to begin to bring those things to me and by faith you may say I already know this well God is saying it again and he's honing in on it again and he's telling us if you really do want to see a change he's saying I'm wanting you to come by faith and bring by faith and manifest the heavenly things that I have for you into the physical realm it's not something that alien messages are not coming out from aliens messages are in the heavens and those messages are for us and God is saying for us things that we need to grab a hold of and bring them forward in the spirit. God is not wanting to ask us to seek out things. He's wanting us to go after it. You need that A in school, baby? He's saying, you want that A? Go to me in prayer and say, God, help me to focus my brain so that I can, I can grab that A that I want to get. You know that the health department is now saying that social media is an addiction and cell phones is an, I heard you say, yeah, Tori, you're a psychiatrist, right? So you know it. You know, I need you to verify because this is what they're saying, right? Yes, they're saying social media is an addiction now. And our people, and people are addicted. And they're saying cell phones, people are addicted to cell phones. And the crazy thing is that if people are surrounded on the cell phone, and here's what they said in this uh, documentary that I was reading, uh, this thing from this, uh, this doctor, she was saying that if on your cell phone you could connect to 500 people, why are you so lonely? Say it again. If you could connect <laughs> with 500 people on this cell phone, why are we so lonely? And the reason that we are so lonely is because we are seeing things with our eyes and trying to fill voids in our life and attract things to us. We are trying to attract things to us from the things that we are seeing. And because we want it, we go after it in visual sight. And we are no different than a scientist if our goal is to go outside of the realm of the will of God for our life and the things that he has for us. We are no different than an astronomer who's looking. Remember what the psychologist said. She said, these scientists are crazy. If a psychologist of the mental mind is saying a scientist is crazy, how much more can the church be crazy if we're going outside of a God, a real God, who is saying, if you trust me, if you come after me, I have your life in my hands. I know the plans I have for you. I know what I want to do in your life. I know how to make you successful. I know how to make you prosperous. I want you to give that up and let it go and seek me. How crazy do we look? See, when you're asking yourself the question, the question is how do we proclaim and declare our agenda in this world and show forth the praises of him who called us as people who are peculiar? See, the true unusual alien, the chosen peculiar people agenda is this. You ask yourself, what is the agenda? The agenda for us they have their worldly alien agenda. Here's our agenda. Our agenda is to know who we are. To know who we are. To know who we are. And you know how we'll know who we are? When our offspring knows who they are. And our offspring doesn't only have to be our physical babies, it could be our spiritual babies. When our young people can walk in a school 
I walked into a, a, a classroom of a student who visited this church a, a little while ago. And the student, it was cute. And I'm not saying this to down the student, I'm just telling you where we are. I walked into the classroom, kids were all over the place. This was Friday, this Friday. Kids were all over the place. Their teacher was out, I had to cover their class. And I walked in, and I'm not used to this chaos. <laughs> not in my classroom, but this was another teacher's classroom. So I walk in, and the student who visited the church, um, they kind of ran off to the side like they hid. I said, don't hide. <laughs> you know what's about to come down in this room. <laughs> and he shook his head, and he smiled. And I don't care. I, yeah, I know they're filming me. It's on YouTube, whatever. Board of Education, I have to tell the truth. I'm sorry. The truth shall make us all free. I walked in there. I said, Spirit of God in this place, why is, the world, why is this room so disruptive? I said, Spirit of God, take control of this place. And let me just share something. When we stand up, that little young man stood up and was like, yeah, yep, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, Spirit of God, take control of this room. Every child will do their work. Every child will settle down. Every child will look for what they have to do. Spirit of God's one little boy said, you church, you, you church. And I said, uh, yes, I go to church. He's like, well, you be my church. I said, I can't be your church. God can be your church. And he said, I haven't been to church in a while. I said, well, honey, I'm going to pray for you this weekend that you would find your church. And remember, we're down the street from here. You can look for us. But I said, I said, let me not get distracted, young man. I said, Spirit of God, take control of this room. I want to tell you guys that that room began to settle. And you could see a wave. There was one little boy who was like, man, F this, F this. And I looked at him, and I went right up to him. And I said, God, help me. Give me strength. You put me here. I said, in Jesus' name, I take that tongue and bring it under the subjection of God. And he looked at me, and he said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked away. I was like, and everything in me was like, no, you know, you have that nervous feeling, like, oh, they actually listen. <laughs> and I had this nervous feeling inside of me that they actually listen. But what I'm telling you is not strange. You know why it's not strange? Because there was a man named Daniel. And there was that man named Daniel. He was special. He was a very special man. And we're going to look at him briefly as we begin to start wrapping up. My question to you, God gave me this question for the church, and I want to throw this out here as I look at Daniel. Are you confused? God told me, he said that, Sharice, I don't want you ever to walk in confusion. And I say, I know God. I say, I don't want to walk in confusion either. But sometimes I have, um, sometimes I just have these questions. He said, remember, you can always be at peace if you leave me with those questions. And I said, you're right. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to throw that out there to you. Are you confused? Are things seemingly complicated to you? Do you find yourself in a state of confusion regularly? Are you unsettled or perplexed about your future? Or are you unsettled or perplexed about where you are right now? What ideology has entered your mind like the scientists and astronomers and researchers, researchers and brought forth confusion in your life? God was not the author of that. Any, remember the psychologist said, when we see things with our physical minds, our physical eyes, and we begin to interpret it in a way and it couldn't possibly happen. It couldn't possibly be a mouse on Mars if Mars is not habitable for life. So why would you put out there in the world that, that there's a mouse that mice can live on Mars if mice need the same exact things that we need to live and it's not possible to live, human life cannot take place on Mars? So psychologists are looking at scientists saying, what kind of thing is this that you're saying? Is it possible you're trying to create stuff in your head because your brain sees? Well, are you, are you at a state of confusion because of somebody's ideology? Somebody has gotten in your mind and told you you shouldn't be where you are. You shouldn't go to that church that you're going to. You shouldn't go to that location that you are going to. You should go over here. Or you shouldn't have that job that you have. Or you shouldn't go after that house or that home that you 
you were wanting or you shouldn't um, go after this specific thing that you were desiring or that is a crazy thought process for you to begin to start praying and asking for God to heal you Petra on something that everybody can get and physical means can take care of it are, are you going are you listening to someone's ideology or are you listening to something God's already spoken over your life I, today, God is desiring for us to break the mental ideology that sets over our life. How do you connect to bad ideology? Every time you go to a doctor or you go before an apartment um, complex building to uh, get a new apartment or go after a home or go after your car or go after your job or go after something that you know God is telling you in your spirit to go after, and every time somebody looks at you and says, you can't do it, then when you hear that what is your next step that's where we are today scientists next step is to search but it's fruitless our step is to pray and how do we know this because we're going to look at Daniel really fast see there's a difference one question God also asked are you embarrassed by the state you're in He said, you can tell people who are embarrassed by the state they're in because they laugh, they blow it off, or they walk away and don't want to address it or talk about it. And God does not want us walking in embarrassment. If, if he has given us himself, when you should not be leaving your house, if you cannot confidently walk out and someone says to you oh that's going on in your life you should be able to confidently look at the person and say yes it makes me sad it makes me ups upset but I know my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think what is your response if your response can't be that then here is where we are matching ourselves with scientists astronomers and ideological thinking because we are connected by sight instead of by faith Amen. to our situation and God is separating us from that our step church is a walk of the spirit our step church is a walk of the spirit elder Dell says it all the time we live too much in flesh we need to walk by the Spirit so we don't fulfill these desires to seek out things with our eyes by the flesh. There is a difference between being steady and tripping. There is a difference between wonderment and confusion. There is a difference between dreaming and worrying. There is a difference between a sound mind and a bugged out mind. Scripture says we have to, in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, we have to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. All my soldiers who are out there, when we think about being in war, when men and women go to war to fight for this country, they're not thinking about, I hope my wife has chicken or my husband has chicken ready for dinner because I really like barbecue chicken. Right, Tina? They're not thinking that, right? They go to war, right? They're not thinking that. Our soldier doesn't connect himself with the things of this word, world. As a good soldier at Jesus Christ, we, choo we don't choose to follow and connect ourselves to ideology that produces more confusion. See, Daniel had to deal with this. In, uh, in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 3, Daniel was, it said in verse 3 of Daniel, chapter 6, that Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes. Some people believe that, okay, if I'm going to live for Christ, that means that I need to dummy down how I live. Oh, no, I'm not dummying down anything. In fact, I'm living more of in a glorious state because I'm living in the confidence of who I am serving. And who I am serving is a great God. And so when you look at me, you see great because I serve great. And what, you, and what I put in front of me is what you see who is God who I'm pushing forth to increase him and decrease me. So when you see me, you see him. And if you don't see him, I'm walking in the flesh and I want to cast that down and I want to walk in the spirit. And so when you do see me, you see great. 
because I serve a great God. And it's not in my pride I serve great. I serve great because I serve a great God. And he is an awesome God. And because he's a powerful God, I won't succumb to anything less than the best. And I won't cower down to anything but less than my best. And I won't cower down to anything that is not of God. I'm going to always try to walk in the excellence and the power of God because he is inside of me and he is going to push forth for people to see the things that he has in my life to make me a powerful and a strong person, not because of me, but because of him. And then when people see my life, they're going to see the great that I serve and they will see what it means to take my faith, the things that manifest them in the spirit. So the next time I stand next to a scientist and he says, I'm looking at something and that thing is creating an emptiness inside of me and fruitlessness inside of me. I look at them and say, oh, you want to see what God can do? I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God, show forth your strength so that this scientist could see what faith really looks like and manifest before him the miracles of what science cannot do. When something looks at me and says you are sick in your body, hey, I want to show you what it's like to live with this disease. Sister Ingrid, I will be more powerful than ever because I'm going to manifest the spirit of God in my life so that scientists, when they look at me, they can say, she grabbed a hold of that by faith and manifested that in the physical realm by the spirit. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to do. That's how I want to live. I want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And that's what, da that's what Daniel did. Daniel, as he was walking, churches were wrapping this up. Daniel, as he was walking, scripture said he had an excellent spirit. He had an excellent spirit. And that spirit was, hallelujah. He had an excellent spirit. And it's not because of Daniel. It's because of God himself. And scripture says he had an excellent spirit before the people. And Darius king, the king. This was in the city of Babylon. And if anyone who knows Babylon, Babylon was a crazy place. People often compare the United States or what's going on in around the world to Babylon. That's the type of place that Daniel lived. And where Daniel lived, he, scripture said because he had an excellent spirit, people found fault with him. And people will find fault with you. People will say what they're going to say about you. Why are you doing that? Why are you going there? Why are you hanging out there? Why are you not showing up at this? Why are you not showing up at that? Why are you not sticking around for this? Why are you not sticking around for that? Why are you doing that? People will show. And the people got so annoyed and irritated with Daniel that the people decided that they were going to bring him before the king. And they were going to say to the king, um, we're, we're, not, we're, going to, we're going to say to Daniel, we're going to, we're going to get Daniel real good. We're going to tell the king that this Daniel, um, and then the, somebody else said, no, 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 no. Don't tell him Daniel because that guy loves Daniel. That king loves Daniel. Don't tell him anything about Daniel. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go after the law that Daniel follows, which is the God that Daniel serves. And we're going to have a decree made that anybody who doesn't bow down to the king's law will be thrown in the lion's den. And Daniel heard what they were planning to do. And what did Daniel do? He didn't, and I know social media is not there, but listen to what the Spirit of God is telling us. Daniel did not run with his mouth to people to complain about what the king was doing, what the king was, the decree the king put out. Daniel did not go and say, oh, because I am of a Jewish nation, that's why these Babylonian people are treating me this way. Daniel did not go and do any of those things. What did Daniel do? Daniel, scripture says in verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, as he always did. This did not shake Daniel. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and he gave thanks before the God of Israel as he did aforetime, meaning as he always did. It did not shake 
Daniel because Daniel had an excellent spirit. And when you have an excellent spirit, things are not going to shake you. So what are we going after for church? We're going after an excellent spirit. That is what we're going after, church. We're going after that excellent spirit, not from Daniel, from God. The king was so distraught about this that the king looked and said, I wish I had never signed a decree because he loved Daniel so much. Even though this was a Babylonian king, he liked Daniel. He loved Daniel's work. He loved the way Daniel operated because Daniel operated in an excellent spirit, even though Daniel was living in an area of Babylon and craziness. He didn't, con Daniel didn't condemn where he was. If the job that you're in right now is, go is looking like it's crazy and chaotic like my job was, don't complain about it. Don't go in there and fuss about it. Don't go to anybody and fuss about it. You do what I just did and what Daniel just did and what I need to do more. I need to walk into that place and say, I declare and decree that this place will be God's place and I'm going to walk in an excellent spirit and I'm going to lead in an excellent spirit and I'm going to live in an excellent spirit. That is what Daniel did. The king commanded that Daniel be cast into the lion's den because the king signed that decree. And now when the king spake and said unto Daniel, that God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. This Babylonian king who was in a city that was crazy is now looking at Daniel and saying, if, this is, if your God really is God, he's going to deliver you out of this lion's den. And what happened? This Daniel, worship team, you can come up. This Daniel was able, scripture said that he was in that lion's den. And when the king who couldn't sleep fasted and prayed. Now, isn't it interesting? You're from Babylon who served many gods. He didn't go to pray to his God. He went and fasted and prayed that Daniel be all right. And when he went to that lion's den and found Daniel alive, he was so excited. And the people who made him sign the decree, they got thrown in the lion's den with their family. And they got eaten up. Their God didn't answer them. They got eaten up and chewed up alive. Here's the part that makes me so excited. In verse 16, it says, then the king commanded, they brought Daniel and cast him. Well, no, no, no. Verse 25, got ahead of myself. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people's nations and languages that dwell on the earth peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, before your God. Men will tremble in fear, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. Can you imagine scientists looking at us and saying, you know what, what we were searching for, that was a little crazy. But now we're going to look at your God, because your God is able to deliver. It says, for he is the living God, steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and worketh signs and wonders in the heaven and earth, who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. No one's saying that they're crazy crazy for seeing things in the heavens. Scripture says there are going to be signs and wonders in the heaven. That part is not crazy that there's things that are going to be in the heavens, but you need to attribute it to a real God who creates things that happen in the heavens. Anything that we see that, that looks abnormal, we may say to ourselves, you know what? I wonder if God is doing that. I wonder if God is setting that sign there for us. I wonder if God is doing that. That's where our question should be, not is there another life form? So this Daniel scripture said prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus and Cyrenian and the Persian. I want to tell us, church, a double-minded man, God had to speak to me on this. And this is when I finally settled in my spirit. God, your way is the way I want to go. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and gets nothing from God. It's not possible to receive all God has for us if we're in a double-minded state, church. We have to live in a place that it's God or it's not God. We have to live in a place that when we get up in the morning and we go to our jobs or we go to wherever we're going to go, that we say, you know what, God, if you have me here, I'm here for the purpose and plan that you have me here. We cannot be double-minded saying, I'm not sure, God, if you want me here. I'm not sure, God, if you want me here. I'm not sure, God. God has given you proof. Scripture, God himself is saying even now, he said, I've given some of my people proof, proof after proof after proof for where they should be, and they are still resisting it because they're stuck into an ideology of how they wanted to see things go. But if you begin to separate 
separate yourself from that ideology and you begin to move forward in the things that I have told, spoken in your spirit. Yes, I have told you once. I have told you twice. I have told you three times. Yes, that's where I want you to be. I want you to listen to me and be submissive to my spirit. You know I'm talking to you and you feel the tug on your spirit regularly to do what I'm calling you to do and yet you still question it. Why? Because this is unusual for you. You are not used to a location like this but I'm calling you to a place and to a season. You've asked me for something different. You've asked me for something greater. You've asked me to show myself and I am telling you I will show you myself this day if you will finally submit your mind and stop being double minded and stop questioning where I'm sending you and settle into the fact that I want greater for you more than you want for yourself. That saith the Lord. I want greater for you than yourself. Hallelujah. If you can stand to your feet. Hallelujah. You want greater for me, God, than I want for myself, than I want more, God. God, I am not where I need to be, Lord God, but take me there, oh God. Hallelujah. Take me there, God. Take me there, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take me there, God. This is a prayer we each have to pray for ourselves. God, take me to that place where you want me to be, Lord God. Take me to that place. There's a song you all sing. Take me to that place, Lord. To take me to that secret place. That's the song for today. Take me to that place. Take me to that secret place. Hallelujah. He kayana masia. He yada masi kayana masia. He yada masi kayana masia. He kayana masia. We have to decide for ourselves today where we are going to stand in our mind. Hallelujah. God said to me when I was playing. I said, Lord, how do you want me to do the altar call today? And he said, it's the mind. He said, the enemy has been confusing his people. And, bring, and he said, he's not the author of that. And he said that he doesn't want people attributing him to that confusion anymore. He said, he told me, even he was very specific with me. And I said, Lord, but aren't we supposed to ask questions? He said, but they're asking for questions outside of my will for their life. And he said, if they really want questions answered from me, they have to seek me and ask me questions related to my will for their life. We teach in our society, in the public school system, we teach kids to ask questions all the time. And I love that. But the one danger in that is a lot of times our kids ask questions about the world and they don't have an answer from God. They don't know how to ask questions within God. And my heart breaks all the time. And so I, when I'm teaching my classes, I always try to allow the Holy Spirit to direct me on how to teach them to ask questions because they can't deny the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Holy Spirit is here. When people say, you can't say Jesus, you're right, I can't. But I can say, Holy Spirit, I didn't say Jesus. I said, Holy Spirit, I say love, I say joy, I say peace. I say long-suffering, kindness, patience, goodness, gentleness, mercy. Take control. And that's asking within the will of God. If you are needing us to partner with you, and I asked that question wrong, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. God is wanting to break confusion over his people. And we desire to partner with you that you may walk not in confusion, but in knowing and strength and power. So what we're praying for is God's strength and power. Prayer team, come up. And what we're, please come up.